What's going on guys, J. Coon Prime here, and as promised, I told you I wouldn't leave you hanging on this one, this is the spoiler-ridden review of Terminator Dark Fate. So, if you have not seen Terminator Dark Fate yet, I highly encourage you to either A, click off this video right now and go watch the spoiler-free review, that way you don't get pissed off at me later, or B, you turn off this video and go see the damn movie and then come back and hit unpause and continue watching the video. Now, I brought somebody along this time around. I've always been a fan of how he and I talk to movies and it's actually been something I've been wanting to do for a while and we did it briefly with the summer movie Primecast videos, but Primecast is such a hassle to schedule, especially when you have guests, so... I figured with this one, well, we're both fans of the franchise, so might as well get them on board. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my dad, Papa Prime. What's up, peeps? Alrighty, so um, I guess, well, you've been warned, YouTube, so here we go. So I guess first things first, the big thing that we should address is the one thing that none of us ever expected, and that was the death of John Connor. Now, me personally, I almost threw a drink in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> and I was left for the remaining two hours going, well, how are they going to piece this together now that the big catalyst of the past six movies is now dead? I'll have to be honest. At this point, I was not stunned. Because uh, when we had heard quite some time back that uh, James Cameron uh, was back on board and that he was saying, I'm going to fix this type of thing, I had a distinct undertone that he was going to do something drastic in order to wipe the slate clean. Which I did find incredibly amusing, uh, just kind of looking around after going to see the film. And I ran across an IGN video where they were talking to James Cameron and like they did the spoiler thing just like everybody else did and they talked about John dying and James Cameron went, yeah, that was my idea. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and everybody at IGN just looked at him like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, if there was, if there was one, you, you think, well, you just mentioned it. John Connor has been the linchpin of every film, uh, the TV series, all of that. He has been the one central character. You've had all different kinds of Terminators. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had different people play Sarah, you know, but Sarah's mission has always been protect John, you know, at any cost. Yeah. You know, prepare him for what was to come. And so... There would be no other way that he could effectively blow that up, you know, than to get rid of John. Yeah, and that ultimately sent a giant message throughout the entire film, and I actually said this in my spoiler-free review, and yes, I hate referencing Terminator 3, <laughs> but it's the one line that actually makes sense. Judgment Day is inevitable. Whether John's at the point of the resistance or somebody else is, one way or another, it's going to happen. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. And I think that was the point he was really trying to drive with scrubbing off John Connor. Well, I think that was the thing that I, that I got the most uh, out of this. I mean, we have uh, discussed this franchise at length over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I still think, I, I still have vivid memories of, of seeing the first movie the first time and just being totally blown away. Um, I thought it was such an amazing original concept. And then when the second film came along, you know, you didn't really think, how in the world is he ever going to top that? And then he managed to turn Arnold into a hero instead of a villain. Yeah. And, created a villain that was 
you know, brain bending beyond what anybody had seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I really felt like it just kind of went downhill after that. Well, of course it did, because he was you know, no longer at the helm. <laughs> well, and, and I think that's exactly what he was looking at, you know. But what you just referenced about, you know, the Terminator saying that, that Judgment Day was inevitable and that no matter how hard we tried to destroy this or that technology, that somebody, and that was another thing that this, that this film showcased, mm -hmm. because, you know, Sarah is very bent that she knew that they had stopped Judgment Day, and here this was happening again. How the hell did that happen? Yeah. And, and she's bitching about the scientists, you know, the goddamn scientists that always have to, you know, to keep, no, nobody ever learns. Uh, but it was equally important to realize that that humans could, you know, mount a resistance whether they had John or not. Somebody else would step up. Yeah, and that that was one of the things that I always um, found intriguing throughout watching the film because the film has a lot of points where it does kind of reference the other films, even the films that they're not acknowledging. And again. I hate that I have to reference it, but it's the only one that makes sense, and it's Terminator 3. <laughs> <laughs> I really hate that I have to call back to this film. <laughs> he keeps eating the poison pill. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the only accurate reference. That's the problem. So, like, when the TX came back in time, uh, John had gone completely off the grid, Skynet couldn't find him, uh, so they sent the TX with a alternate mission. Well, okay, if we can't get John, then we can get his lieutenants. And that will still help affect things in the future. And I just kind of sat there and went, oh, okay, I guess that kind of makes sense. And this kind of rides on the same damn thing where whether it's John at the helm or not, humanity is still going to rise up and... Uh, well, it's it's not Skynet anymore. It is now Legion is trying to prevent that at all costs. Like, we want humanity scrubbed off. So if we can't get him, we're going to get her. And I, I think that was very well executed. I mean, if you stop and think about it, uh, you don't have to look very far in today's technology to see how many different companies with different names work on some different form of artificial intelligence. Yeah. You know, the, the fact that it has to boil down to, to one, you know, that accomplishes it. I mean, like if you took, if you eliminated one, does that mean that everybody else is going to stop? Oh, hell no. No, not, not, not a chance. And that was the, to me, that was the thing where, over the course of the various movies. Now, the, the, the TV series of Sarah Connor Chronicles, I really got on board with that because that was about <coughs> John's growing years. Yeah. That was about him becoming uh, the, the person and, and how, how tough it was for him to acclimate to that. But the fact that he was still constantly being pursued no matter how many times they had, you know, tried to to eliminate factors that would lead to Skynet, they still just kept coming. Yeah, because, like, okay, they uh, they destroyed Cyberdyne, and then they had to jump forward into the future, and now they're taking out... I, I don't even remember the name of the uh, the AI. I think it was, what, like, the, uh, the, the chess maker or something like that? The maestro? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was like, oh, so this is going to lead to Skynet now. And I, I think that was one of the big things that they were kind of working towards. Like, yeah, Cyberdyne got destroyed, but uh, Skynet's going to happen anyway. They're just going to name it something else. Yeah. <laughs> to me, one of the big moments out of that entire TV series that really struck me was when um, uh, the guy that played, he was supposed to be Kyle Reese's brother. Oh, Derek Reese, yeah. Derek, okay. Okay. And he was standing in the hallway, and he's looking into the room, and he's watching uh, the Terminator that, that Summer Glau played. Yeah. 
and she was ballet dancing. And he stood there watching her, and you all you you saw the tiniest trickle of a of a tear run out of his eye. And he went back and he told John. He said, "You know what?" He said, "If we're not careful, he said they are going to get rid of us." He said, "Because they're going to be us." Yeah. <laughs> and that one, that one really slapped me upside the head. It's like, shit, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And there was no better example of that than uh, introducing Arnold's character in this movie, Carl. Which, I, I will definitely say, thank God they did not show Carl until the third act of the movie. Because if they had showed him anywhere else, you would not have given a single shit about the rest of the cast at all. <laughs> it, was, it, it was a good step up. And the other thing that I thought was really uh, intriguing and a uh, monster spoiler alert here is that Carl was the one that had been sending out the uh, messages to Sarah where she had been hunting Terminators all these years. Yeah. That she still kept, you know, she was still so bitter over, and I mean, I, I thought it was it was a really interesting play once again, huge props to a, a special effects department that created that scene of a young Linda Hamilton and a young Arnold Schwarzenegger walking up and executing John and then walking off like nothing ever happened. That was something, like, now there was something about that scene. Now I understand, like, they had to obviously leave her alive because how else are you going to have a movie? But right. we've seen Terminators in scenarios like that. They don't just shoot one person and then just walk off. He they was kill the everyone in the room. <laughs> <laughs> if they had to kill everyone in the room to get to the target, yes. But in this specific instance, he didn't have to do that. As soon as John was dead, mission was done. Yeah, but the she straight up went on the attack against the Terminator, and the Terminator had her by the neck. Yeah. He didn't break the neck, he didn't kill her, he just threw her. And I'm like, the moment you engage a Terminator, the first thing he's going to do is kill you. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. I, I think the difference here, or what the difference he was trying to convey, was that the mission was done. The mission was accomplished. He had killed John Connor, and at that, honestly, I was expecting at that point that as soon as it was done, that he was just going to stand there and and deactivate. Yeah, go you know, on standby or something. That he would just shut something. down, and and nothing, or you know, because I had always been curious about that. You know, in in every instance we'd always seen where they would go and try and accomplish a mission. And they would continue relentlessly doing it until something destroyed them. Yeah. And um, uh, I'm actually glad you brought that up because they actually did that in the Sarah Connor Chronicles. There was one episode, I forgot the guy's mission, but um, it, it was something along the lines of like ma securing some type of cargo or something like that. But he, he finished the mission, he holsters his gun or something like that, he walks over... And stands next to a wall, he stands up straight, and then you just see him, like, you just see it in his eyes, he just kind of goes. And it's like, his his CPU goes on standby mode to await further instruction. And that's where he stood for, like, seven years. Just inside that little vault area. Right. But, um, they they did make some comment about that. Um, once we actually see Carl, is that, like, his mission had been accomplished and he received no further instructions, so he was just kind of adrift for 20 right. years. He no longer had a purpose, so... And th this was actually one of the things, like, talking on the phone with you the other day, that I was kind of like, okay, well, how did this happen? And then I remembered uh, in Terminator 2 where the Terminator is talking about his CPU... There are actually two versions of that scene. There's the director's cut, which admittedly is the one I always watch, where 
uh, he explains that it's a neural net processor, it's a learning computer, but Skynet presets the switch to read only when they are sent out alone, which is where you get the little scene between John and Sarah where they take the chip out of the Terminator, she tries to break it, and John stops him. The theatrical version of that scene is a lot shorter, where he explains the CPU, and then he just tacks on, the more contact I have with humans, the more I learn. So I'm guessing this is going with the theatrical version of that scene, where the, the switch was already on, so as he wandered around, he just learned to become more and more human, to the point that he actually found a way to acclimate to society, found basically the machine equivalent of a conscience, and just started acting human. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it, that's pretty much the same thing um, that happened with uh, Summer Glau. Yeah. Uh, in in the series, I mean, you know, he had he had altered her, and the the longer she was around, the more she kept learning, and the more she kept, you know, emulating activity that she had seen. The whole business of her, you know having the curiosity about learning to dance. Yeah. You know, has absolutely nothing to do with with any mission whatsoever. I, I think mean, the one just... about her that threw me off the most is they were it was a scene at a gas station. And he's sitting there eating a bag of Doritos and he offers her offers her one and he goes, Never mind, like that something along the lines of well, we're we're different, uh, you wouldn't understand. She walks over, takes a chip out of the bag, and eats it. And she goes, I am different, and walks off. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. Where did but that she, chip go? <laughs> she, she said she was an advanced prototype. An advanced prototype that requires a digestive system? <laughs> well, it doesn't necessarily have to be digestive. I mean, it could be the situation of where she could uh, consume food and you know, dispose of it just for the sake of appearing more human mm -hmm. in any particular setting. You know, if somebody was, if she was around, well, I mean, you know, she was going to the schools where he was at. Yeah. I mean, if she went to a school and she never ate lunch at any time, <laughs> somebody would notice, you know, and say, what, I, I don't know. I didn't chicken? eat lunch at school all that much. Nobody noticed me. So. <laughs> I'm saying it was just it would just be a situation that in order for an infiltration unit to be really effective, yeah, it would have to at least to be able to drink or consume something, whether it mattered to their system or not. Wouldn't really. It's about appearance. Yeah, I think I'm just I'm pulling a Raxel from like the other night like I'm trying to find the entry point and I'm like <laughs> never mind that's not going to work don't 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 hurt yourself yeah, he, was, he was running in a hard circle that's for sure and I understand cuz I mean we we've, we've both been there yeah. sometimes you look at something and I mean you want you want a logical answer but the bottom line out of all of it is that it's it's science fiction and there are not there are not clear-cut paper answers to, to everything. That's which, kind of what, what makes it entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> which Science-based, maybe, but... Yeah. yeah, I'll give Raxel a little bit of credit because I did remember one scene from the original Terminator um, where Kyle is explaining everything to Sarah. And she goes, um, so this thing is from the future. And he goes, one possible future... Yes. I don't know from your point of view. I don't know the tech stuff. Right. So, yeah. Like, I have some sympathy where... I I understand what he was trying to get at. He was trying to find the beginning of the cycle. And the problem with the beginning of the cycle is that there technically is no beginning of the cycle. And I can see why that baked his noodle pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if you think about it, the... Uh... Uh, the scene in uh, Avengers Endgame, yeah, where uh, the Hulk was talking to. Uh, I think he was talking to Rhodey, War Machine. Yeah, 
No, I was I was talking about the oh, one where... Oh, when he's talking to the Ancient One. Yes, yeah. and she drew, you know, what was like, this was your timeline. And then if you move something, there was, there was a spike that went off of it. Yeah. You know, and I mean, that's basically what the entire Terminator series had had been about, really. Because if you think of every single thing that was done, every, every Terminator that went back, every human that went back, you know, was a spike off of a timeline that had the potential to change the outcome of, you know, virtually everything. Yeah. So the business of there being nice, clean loops out of it was just pretty much impossible. Which definitely makes sense because, like, I mean, let, let's be fair here. A guy that can only be conceived if somebody comes back from the past, there's no way you're going to logically, logically make that work. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I mean, the only thing that you can think of there... I mean, whether it was him, whether it was, I mean, the fact that, the fact that John was born, I mean, he, he honestly could have been fathered by anybody. Yeah. You know, it was supposed to be the fact that it was the offspring of Sarah. Yeah. Now, we, we could get all involved in genetics and, and whatever like that, saying that if it wasn't Kyle's. Uh, Kyle Reese's son, you know, that he might not have been the same thing, yada, yada, yada. But, honestly, I think all of that was really just one more way that Cameron was trying to brain bend that story. And the other thing about it was, is that as a, as a story device, once they were caught by the police, mm -hmm. for them to try and explain why they were there, what they were doing, and stuff like that, just made them sound that much more lunatic. Yeah, until the thing actually showed up. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but speak, speaking of a very haunting presence, like, um, we, we, we were both in the Twitch chat last night, and whoever that dude was, I'm not going to mention names since this is going up on YouTube but the the fact that the dude just kept making all those jokes about the the Rev 9 and I thought the Rev 9 was actually pretty fucking frightening because he looked very non-imposing until he got that look on his face and then suddenly he was the most terrifying thing in the room well I think it was honestly kind of a it was building on what they did with, with Robert Patrick years ago as, as the T-1000. Yeah. You know, as far as his physical build, he was not an imposing presence at all. Oh, no, not at all. Very non-threatening. But um, after you saw what he was capable of doing, and then when he would give you that low-brow stare, you know, it, it wasn't so much his face... It was like, oh shit, what happens next? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, what, what else can he actually do? You know what I mean? Which... And I thought, that this, I thought that this version was actually pretty ingenious to say that you had basically melded the hyper-alloy combat chassis, you know, that we've seen walking around both with and without skin. Yeah. And... And molding that together with this liquid metal, you know, type of thing, making making something that's capable of functioning both independently and in tandem. Um, yeah, it does. It 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 make it makes him double frightening because, like, you know, yeah, you can you can torch me and I'll be melting in a puddle over here. <laughs> but by the way, in the meantime. My exoskeleton, I mean, my endoskeleton is going to come along and kick the shit out of you in the meantime. So. Which it did several yeah. times. <laughs> it's like, I, okay, after the third time this thing came up behind you, you think you'd have gotten wise to it by now. <laughs> but they didn't. I mean, I think the other thing that they did that, that was really kind of scary was that uh, when he was... The Border Patrol facility. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
and those guys just mob jumped him. You know, and it was like six, seven guys all over him. (laughs) And then the, you know, then the, the, the edge weapons just kept producing and protruding off of him, you know, in, in any direction, any, anywhere that there was a threat. Yeah. You know, he didn't have to swing an arm, you know, he's just holding them there and it's like, oh yeah, I'll stab you and you and you and you and you. (laughs) (laughs) And that's, that's pretty fearsome, you know, I mean, you're you're not going to, you're not going to do close quarters combat with somebody like that. (laughs) No, not at all. (laughs) But like, holy crap, like... I I always thought the um, now granted I never I never had the fear of uh, the T one thousand the way I did with the T eight hundred but then again I was I was a lot older when the T one thousand came out seeing seeing the T eight hundred skeleton for the first time as a little child like that that was nightmare inducing for me but um yeah just just how this guy portrayed it. Um, I thought he absolutely knocked it out of the park. He didn't have that thousand-mile stare that Robert Patrick did. But then again, he really didn't need to because he now was in a world where he had eyes everywhere. Yeah. Like, finding, finding them was not an issue. It was just a matter of getting to them. Which I I have to like because there was definitely situations like I know you didn't like the over the top action sequences, and I've always hated situations in a game or in a movie rather. Can't tell I'm a Twitch streamer, can you? In a game, <laughs> <laughs> um, I hate situations in a movie where people just completely forego common sense and intelligence and just go, "Oh, here you go for the sake of the movie." Him walking out. You guys know where I could get my hands on a chopper? And then they just fucking give him one! And it's like... Don't you have to have some kind of authority to have a helicopter? (laughs) I get the feeling that he wasn't given one. I mean, maybe, yeah. Or either that, it was just they... Maybe they told him... I mean, that sounds like one of those innocent conversation things, you know, like the two guys were standing there, and they assume him, you know, to be a an agent, a, a Border Patrol agent, and he wants to know where a helicopter is at, and it could be just as simple as, oh, yeah, the state police has got one at the hangar, you know, over Why? at such and such a place, <laughs> and then, yeah, then he just kills the two of them and takes their car and proceeds to that location. And see, I, that's where I feel like kind of Terminator 2 did it better. And it was like, hey, you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Hey, that's a nice bike. <laughs> and, like, you knew right away what was about to happen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but with this one, it definitely just kind of seemed like, hey, can, can I have a helicopter? And it just kind of felt like everyone just went, yeah, sure, here you go. Well, I think they had already just established that he could easily get his hands on whatever it was he chose to get his hands on. Yeah. At that point, so you know, stopping him from doing that at that point. I mean, it's like when he when he walked into the information center, and then the next scene was him at the console, and everyone was dead. Six people dead. <laughs> you know? So I mean, yeah. But that was one of the things. Uh, since since we've talked about the Rev Nine for a minute, I actually want to talk about Mackenzie Davis's uh, Grace because, like, I w- I was actually very impressed with her. Um, where she made the comment of, like, there's... Yeah, like, Danny was about to go get the cops, and she was like, if you send a hundred cops in between you and the Rev-9, all you're gonna get is a hundred dead cops. And it's like, well, shit. (laughs) But, um... I I really liked how they put her together. it It was the first time we ever saw the human resistance. Like, they had always captured and reprogrammed Terminators and all that type of stuff. But this was the first time they actually kind of made one of their own. Essentially a Terminator. And I thought Uh, that was very well done. I guess you would say she was as as close to that, you know, as as they could get without, you know, just basically, well, killing her and turning her into something else. Yeah, yeah. In order for her to remain, you know, I mean, that's probably... Well, I mean, she said she was an augment, 
but I think it was also something that was kind of a, <coughs> another a very well played move by Cameron was to say okay they sent Kyle Reese they sent other humans they know uh, how much of an imbalance there is between a human and a Terminator it was only a matter of time before you know you tried to do something to make the soldier uh, a little bit give him more of a fighting chance yeah um, so sending back someone who was augmented versus somebody who was just human you know makes a lot of logical sense um, the other thing I thought was really interesting was though was was how she well she even tells uh, Danny you know at one point that you know she's made for a high intensity burst yeah, that taking you know, out Terminators, it, you had to deal with within like the first minute or so. Right. If you didn't get it done by then, then the chances of you surviving was not good. So you know, endurance was really not a factor. It was all about speed, strength, agility, that type of thing, and, and the ability to take punishment. Yeah. Which God knows she did that. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> she took hits in this movie that would make Superman go ow. <laughs> <laughs> she definitely took a pounding but at the same time it didn't take long before she was you know I mean she to the the spirit to fight was there yeah you know to want the drive to want to do it or whatever but I mean when she ran out of gas but she was dead weight yes. oh yeah 100 <laughs> percent which I thought some of those instances were actually like really well played like uh when they went into the pharmacy i thought that was really well done and then you had the really really funny moment in the uh immigration center where she breaks free where she was kind of playing possum and she just looks at everyone did i give you permission to look at my privates <laughs> <laughs> and then she slaps a syringe in and she's good to go again <laughs> yeah as long as, as long as she can juice up she, she's good for another go round yeah. so, uh, and she played it really well too that's got to be a lot of uh, a lot of credit to her uh, as the actress you know to be able to and that's that's another thing where the guy that was that was playing the, the Rev 9 mm. uh in, in any and really anybody that has that has played a Terminator to be able to be in these high intensity situations and never so much as grit their teeth. Yeah, it's you know they're just stone dry. Doesn't matter what you know any any of that kind of stuff to be just as empty as you can possibly be. And yeah, because like you look at stuff like uh, Terminator Two and then. God, Terminator 3. <laughs> where you, you have this Terminator on Terminator action, and, like, Robert Patrick and Arnold were both just completely emotionless, throwing each other through walls, uh, clamping an arm in a friggin' uh, gear of a machine, uh, blowing his head in half, and still didn't even flinch. And then in Terminator 3, where you literally had him smack her in the face with a sink. And it was like she, she was expressionless the entire time. <laughs> but, I mean, I like, um, go ahead. I liked in this one where, you know, Arnold, or Carl, you know, fighting uh, the way that he did, how even, even in his instance... You know, there was a one scene where he basically shot off his own arm. Yeah. You know, when he got pinned. And I mean, and that shows you the situation of the, the totally the totally tactical mentality, you know, that he had. It's like, if I'm going to get up and do anything, I can't get, you know, pinned from under here. He obviously wasn't strong enough to move, you know, the, the vehicle that was on him. So... You know, in that respect, it's just, hey, I'll I'll get rid of this broken piece and I'll keep right on moving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, getting getting down to, like, the action sequences and stuff, um, once they made it to the, what, the, the water electrical plant or whatever the hell it was, 
Yes, uh, hydroelectric uh, generation where water going through the dam turns oh, yeah, the yeah, turbines. Yeah. yeah. But um, I I loved the interaction between the Rev-9 and um, the T-800 in that one where, like, the new machine was actually trying to reason with the old machine. Like, you you and I are kind of cut from the same cloth. Just let me have her. And him just kind of going, I came from a time where that that was the goal. It didn't work out then. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I was actually kind of surprised that they did that because I can't think of another time in any one of the movies where a Terminator has ever tried to negotiate about anything. Yeah, because we've spent years, like, it does not, it can't be reasoned with, it can't be bargained with, and now we we have a Terminator that actually tries to bargain. (laughs) Of course, at the same time, you could could say that, okay, he is the most advanced infiltration unit that they've made yeah you know maybe at this point somebody has recognized you know what every once in a while if you just say the right thing or you ask nicely (laughs) (laughs) you get you get what you want if you just ask nicely (laughs) which i mean hey like we definitely saw that personality in the rev nine throughout the course of the film where he was just so polite and nice, and he came off as charming. And it's like, damn, they'll just let him do anything, won't they? That's how they get. He gets close <laughs> enough to to do what he has to do. That's that's you know. I mean, honestly, I I hate to admit it, but I mean that's a page ripped from the professional criminal. Yeah. You know that if the more unassuming they are the more likely they are to get away with whatever it is they're trying to do. You know? Which, I mean, hey, like, uh, was it? it's, it's one of our favorite movies, a movie with George Clooney called Out of Sight. Oh, Lord, yes. Yeah, where he, he's just completely and totally unassuming, walks up to the bank teller and just, in just the most natural tone of voice he can possibly muster. And is like, yeah, that's my associate over there, and uh, you need to give me such and such amount of money or else he's going to pull a gun out of his briefcase and shoot your boss between the eyes. And as she's doing this, giving him the money, completely calm, clearly her eyes are screaming in terror. Mm. But he was like, just keep going. You're doing fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now do me a favor, hand that to That's me. That's a lovely have sweater, a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, Forty forty one banks never used a gun, you know? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so I guess maybe like yeah, over the course of time eventually the machines are gonna start getting conniving too. So Well for the more the more human behavior they observe and the more they analyze that and assimilate it, then the more they will realize how it's used and and be able to apply it you know where it achieves a mission this is this is one of the areas where i feel like um all right cameron cameron obviously you know was not associated with the the various sequels that went on ap- after two yeah he wasn't okay all right but out of ap- out of all the ones that happened after that and i think one that you and i definitely agree on is is terminator genesis Mm -hmm. And Genesis, really, I felt like out of all of them, Genesis was the most inventive one. Yeah. Uh, Now, granted, you did see, uh, what was it, Salvation, where Sam Worthington was the heavily augmented human. Yeah, the first prototype infiltrator. Right. Okay, now, when you went to Genesis, Genesis had the situation of... The, um, uh, the the reprogrammed Terminator that had been around for years. And I did love all of the interaction in that one between him and, and Kyle Reese, you know, about being old but not obsolete. Yeah. <laughs> which I thought all of, all of that was really good. And then what they did with John actually being changed into an infiltration unit 
Yeah. You know, and, and that technology, that nanotechnology thing that they used with that, if you really want to look at that and you look at what they did with the Rev-9, it's like you took what they did to John and wrapped it around that endoskeleton or or even kind of a, a similarity between the, the next advanced uh, stage of what the liquid metal would be. Yeah. So I really think that one is, is probably the most significant sequel that is not a James Cameron product. Yeah, and even then, and that was an attempt was to best, reboot the, the entire one. franchise. Yeah. Which they would have done had the box office not flopped. But Well, you know, even with that, I mean, I, I kind of felt like that that, that one almost uh, stuck a pin in it and and ended it. But at the same time, you know, they left the notion at the end that there was still an open possibility of things continuing on, which at the, at the time I saw it, with everything that had happened, I was thinking, oh, great, you know, they, they finally, you know, put an end to the story, you know, saying that there was success. And then before the movie was over with, then I was ready to roll my eyes and go, oh, for pity's sake, this is just going to keep on again and again and again. What's that, so, uh, what's that uh, line from Last Action Hero? We'll never die as long as the grosses <laughs> stay up? Well, the Resident <laughs> Evil movies are absolute proof of that. And I've never seen any of them, but they keep right on going, as, as you have mm. told me repeatedly about, and they never get better. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but no, they, they people don't. keep going to see them, so they go. Well, and even... Even Jojovich herself said they got to stop going to see him. They'll stop making them. <laughs> well, see, I think the audience finally listened because they haven't made one since whatever the last one was called. Um, now Paul W.S. Anderson, instead of ruining Resident Evil for me, has decided to venture out into the rest of the world and ruin Monster Hunter for everybody else. So, <laughs> um, And honestly, with even with this movie... With you know, with, uh, with with Dark Fate, I'm not real sure. I mean, yeah, it's it's open ended, but at the same time, it's open ended in in a way that was the same as as the ending of the of the very first movie. Yeah, and it almost kind of begs the question. Okay, well, we already see that there's basically endless possibilities here. Is there really another original story left to tell? And see, that's, this is why I've been saying for years and why I originally got very excited about Salvation. There's, there's always been two reasons behind why I want a future war movie. I want a post-Judgment Day movie. One, just because I like that scenario and I want to see more of it. Number two... If you do a series of movies post Judgment Day, then there definitively is a way to end it and have it be done. And that's with the destruction of Skynet, or in this case, the destruction of Legion. So, like, it would kind of give everybody what they want if they would just make a post Judgment Day movie. And the best way to do that is RoboCop versus the Terminator. Which, they'll never do it. Never, <laughs> ever make <laughs> They will never do it. I, I would love to see it happen, but it will never happen. <laughs> I swear I think I could tolerate an awful lot of things to get to that point of the last available Terminator that goes into the time displacement chamber and materializes in prehistoric Earth <laughs> and immediately, immediately gets, gets stomped squashed. on by a Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> I mean, that's almost RoboCop versus the Terminator goes to Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, that would be a great way and albeit an insanely funny way to end the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
That's my favorite page in a graphic novel, man. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people in the theater would be pissed, but I would be laughing my ass off. I would. I would. I'd, I'd be roaring. <laughs> I'd be absolutely roaring. <laughs> and like, you're you're absolutely right. Now, granted, the the story is outdated at this point, but like, RoboCop versus the Terminator would be a fantastic way to just kind of put a pin in the series, especially if you were lucky enough to get Cameron on board to do it. Like, hey, we want to do this, and we want this to be the last one, which is why we're going to use this story. It doesn't even have to necessarily be RoboCop versus the Terminator, because if you look at it, uh, uh, Mackenzie Davis as as Grace in this movie, it's a highly augmented human, and what we saw with Sam Worthington and Salvation a uh, similar type of thing, you know, a, a, a big intertwining of, of human and, and uh, android systems. Yeah. That type of thing. And that's what RoboCop was. So, I mean, if it, if it, takes, if it takes a resistance leader that is basically as much machine as he is human, that has the ability to bring things to a close. Yeah, and then you it, even, it would essentially be the same story. Yeah, and you could even segue it properly just like they did in RoboCop where okay, RoboCop is the reason why Skynet was kind of conceived to begin with. You could do the same thing with an augment, have them come back in time, have them tussle with a couple terminators, and then they get apprehended and during uh their capture, another terminator comes back through time and forcefully marries them into the Skynet software. And then, bing, bang, boom, you have your catalyst of Judgment Day right there. Yeah. So, I mean, like, it, it's really not hard to piece this shit together, chat. It's really not. <laughs> <laughs> I did the exact same thing with Injustice 3. Like, okay, Superman said that the Phantom Zone couldn't contain him, so Injustice 3... Superman comes back out, and now he's not alone. He's brought Doomsday and Zod with him. There you go. There's your plot line for Injustice 3. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if the biggest missed opportunity for reality TV, podcast, YouTube, whichever it is like that, is for somebody to put a camera and microphones in the writer's room. Oh, I got, that some that that would be some of the funniest shit you've ever heard in your life. I well, guarantee. Well, you know, it. you're gonna get some stuff that's just gonna bounce off the walls and mm-hmm. slide down into the floor, you know. And but I think it would be what we all. I think we all know that that's how this process goes on. Yeah. You know, does somebody that granted that when, when the guys are actually doing the writing, they tend to be closet people because they like to be undisturbed. Yeah. But when it comes to putting ideas on the table of what they've come up with, I'll I'll bet you some of it is outrageous. <laughs> oh, I guarantee you, like, cause um, uh, you've heard me talk about it before, uh, death battle, and um, they were they were talking for a long time, like they wish that they could record the brainstorming sessions of certain death battles where it was kind of a round table deal. But it somehow always turned into a two-hour argument of this character would kill this character because of this. No, that's bullshit. This character would kill <laughs> this character because of this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, the moment I heard Ben and Chad talk about that, I was like, yeah, I, I want to see the recordings of that. I want to see Sean Boland get so pissed that he flips a table because they killed Goku a third time. <laughs> I mean, honestly, when it comes to the the whole group of of the Terminator films, uh, the business of any human against the Terminator is already uh, a ridiculous overmatched thing. I mean, straight up, one-on-one, they don't stand a chance. The, The various creative ways that they have come up with stopping or destroying a Terminator uh, to me has been the source of either well it has been the source of both really good action sequences and some of the most ridiculous horse shit we've ever seen <laughs> on the film so, 
and that's really, I think that's really what, what winds up happening is how many <coughs> different ways, how many different things, whatever, can we use to try and stop the unstoppable machine? And invariably, you get some bad choices. Yeah. You know, some of the things, that, and it's fine to have that. You can have things that they try, and I think that was one thing that the, that the first movie really showcased. I mean, Kyle knew before he ever came back that once he got to that present day time that he was going to be seriously shorthanded for effective firepower. Yeah. You know, against you know what he was up against. And he was grappling with anything that he could come up with you know, under but he even tells Sarah. You know, she asked him, "Can you stop it?" And he said, "With these weapons, I just don't know." Yeah. You know, so that I think that's been really interesting. You know, and for all all of the different things that have been used, and I mean, like I said, some of it's been really good. You sit back and go, "Shit, I wish I'd have thought of that." <laughs> you know, why, why didn't I think of that? You know, and then the other stuff, you know, has been like, "Oh, for pity's sake, really?" You know. <laughs> I, I don't know, like, I guess with me it's always been, um, situations of, like, I I take action scenes for exactly what they are. They're, they're fluff pieces, they're, they're time movers, because, I mean, let's be fair, most of the time an action movie's plot is not strong enough to be carried on its own, and if it was, it wouldn't be an action movie anymore, it'd be a damn drama, so... <laughs> Well, I mean, I realize that there is a level of Hollywood, you know, with anything that they do. Yeah. But at the same time, and I mean, sometimes you're going to have one or two things that are going to make you, you know, raise the eyebrow and go, eh, I think that's bullshit, you know. <laughs> but but some, sometimes they just go so far around the bend, it, it's just unreal. And so sometimes I'm amazed that they even think that this was a good idea to put it on film. You mean like the plane on plane mating sequence in this one? <laughs> That's one little example. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so full full disclosure for those listening, uh, uh, Papa Prime has had a growing irritation of over the top action scenes over the years. <laughs> Can I say the entire Fast and Furious series? <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, personally, I don't care if we really offend them, so. <laughs> You've spent 20 years offending us. It's our turn, <laughs> so. <laughs> now, I mean, granted, there's been other stuff that they've done that was just... And you, you also have to look at the... You're looking at the context of the film, too. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes things, some well, somebody would use something against a Terminator because it's an act of desperation. It's all they have at the moment. It's yeah. about survival. And in that respect, you know, and to me that was that was the thing about the first movie. You talked about how when you saw it for the first time, how bad it frightened. Oh, uh, seeing the T eight hundred for the very first time, yeah. As now, what I was like five or six. When the I saw that time, for the first time? The first time I saw the movie, it was one of those things where you're going through and you're watching it, and every time he did something, you were thinking, is that it? <laughs> is, is he dead? Is he really, is it over? You know, and I mean, it's like when he, when, when he blew up the truck. You know, you were like, shit, you know, that was, that was heavy duty. And then, you know, the, the metal skeleton comes out, walks out of the fire, you know, and you're sitting there in a the movie theater going, okay, what the fuck can kill this thing? <laughs> oh, my God. You know? <laughs> and I think that was, the, that was the part of that movie. See, when, when you have that, even in science fiction, science fiction still needs boundaries. Mm -hmm. And he was staying in, in the sandbox of what he had determined, you know, what, what the Terminator was, was capable of doing it. But for the audience, it was, it was like one more level of, what the hell? And that, that's entertaining. But yeah, two, two planes 
rubbing up against each other <laughs> in in midair, and let's throw a lot of sparks, and a wing rips off, but nothing blows up. Are you serious? I mean, any other time we watch a we watch a hero on the ground with a rocket launcher, all he's got to do is get one clean hit. Yeah, and it it absolutely ob- obliterates it instantly. You know, what I mean, it's gone. It's just pieces raining all over the county. You know, what I mean? <laughs> and the thing that was really the thing that was really <laughs> rattling me about it, why I was laughing, on laughing and rolling my eyes at the same time, is that the one plane that was hitting the other plane, the one that the Rev Nine was flying, was a refueling tanker. Yeah. It's a flying bomb, man. I mean, come on. <laughs> you don't you don't rub that thing up against anything and survive. No. You know? <laughs> but all right, we are rolling up on about an hour here, so let Yikes. let's go ahead and go on to uh, final thoughts. Uh, what what were your final thoughts on Terminator Dark Fate? Um. Well, Cameron said he wanted to to do. Uh, uh, set the record straight I think he definitely did that uh, the creation of the new characters uh, that he did I, I think were were well done uh, I totally agree with you about uh, Arnold's role not being a central one but yet a vital one Yes, and uh, the way he played it uh, to be both vital to action and uh, <laughs> providing some good laughs and you know, having that element of comedy in a in a, a dire action thing is always a, a big plus. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the look of it. I mean, o- other than those those few, you know, really extreme edges of action, uh, he is it, it's a really solid film. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty much in the uh, the same ballpark as that. Like, in my opinion, this this is the best Terminator since Terminator Two. Um, I'm very curious to see where they go with this because, I mean, there, there's no way it's not going to do well at the box office because I've already looked at the weekend numbers and, uh, yeah. I think for anybody... A, weekend, if, uh, a sequel is pretty much a guarantee. <laughs> if anybody has seen this or, you know, has listened to this and they're not totally offended and they still want to go see it, um, I think the best thing... To carry into that theater when you sit down is to remember what Cameron's idea was that everything after Terminator 2 is irrelevant. Yeah. If you look at it from that aspect, it's it's a lot easier. If you're if you're sitting there the whole time in the theater trying to put these pieces together that don't fit, you're just gonna drive yourself nuts. And yeah. And you're not gonna get any enjoyment out of it. Hmm? And let's be fair, guys, if you're a real Terminator fan. You don't count those films anyway, so. (laughs) Every self-respecting Terminator fan tries their damnedest to act like Terminator 3 does not exist. So, I mean. I count Genesis. You can skip the other ones, but I like that one at the end. (laughs) But alrighty, thank you very much everyone for listening to us ramble for almost an hour now. Hopefully uh, we entertained you. If you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button, and if you could leave a like rating on the video, I would greatly appreciate it. It helps us out immensely in the eyes of YouTube, plus it lets me know what kind of content you like to watch on the channel. And while you're at it, since um, he's, he's definitely a uh, main staple on the Twitch channel, why don't you head over to twitch.tv slash Prime, where you can catch me doing all sorts of stuff basically to sit there and appease my father five to six (laughs) days a week live on twitch tv so thank you everyone for watching and i'll see you guys next time y'all be cool